All right, everybody, we are live. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, by the way of introduction, my name is Brett Lofgren. I'm the president of Newswhip. Uh, we're going to have a very exciting edition today. Um, we have Zach Silber, who is the chief innovation officer at Kibbit and who also leads their data and insights team. He's joining us today. Um, Zach has 15 plus years experience in the public affairs space and Interesting enough, started off his career as a special assistant to, to James Carville. So I'm sure there's some interesting stories there um, for us, but maybe maybe for another time, right? <laughs> yeah, another time. That sounds great, though. <laughs> um, and Zach seems to be at the right place at the right time. I mean, Kibbit is is you know one of the fastest growing public affairs firms in the U.S. And uh, Zach, just want to say thanks for joining us today. Always. I love News Whip and, and getting to work with you guys. Awesome, awesome. Um, so we were chatting a bit, and and for the topics today, you know, given the president's you know recent uh, infrastructure bill, and we really wanted to unpack what this all means for communications. Um, so we're going to talk about infrastructure. Uh, we're going to talk about you know public policy, and also I think chat through some of the more underrepresented sectors. Um, not making the headlines today. Um, some a bit of housekeeping. We'd love to keep a few minutes reserved at the end for questions. So please feel free to pop them in the chat function, and, and the team will service them to Zach and myself towards the end of the session. Um, but let's let's get started and kick things off. And Zach, I think it'd be good to learn more about yourself, your role, uh, the insights team at Kivit, as well as um, you know getting a sense really of what this concept of the agency of the future uh, means for, for you and the kid. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you read a lot about the agency of the future, but what does it really mean? I, I think in our mind, our take on it is that it's really a constant aspiration. You don't ever just finish the work, cross the finish line, and you can say, okay, we, we've arrived in the future. It doesn't work that way. That, that would make it too easy. Uh, the agency of the future really has to be a, a constant iterative a cycle of innovation. And as a company, what we've done at Kibbit is we've done a couple of things really important. And at the, at the most important thing is the creation of an insights and analytics team that I lead. Uh, we're really committed at Kibbit to adopting the most innovative technologies, data and analytics and integrating them into our work. So this team that we've created and that I oversee, we, we really sit at the intersection of the quantitative data that comes from tools like NewsWhip and the qualitative expertise of the strategists across our different client teams. Our main focus is how do we give a data-driven advantage to every engagement, every situation that we're in. And to be the agency of the future, we have to be doing that every day, all day, every day, and also making sure that we're constantly marrying the art and the science, as I said, right? What the client teams, the strategists, the expertise about client situations with the quantitative perspective that we can obtain through different tools and technologies, uh, NewsWhip among them. So I guess, is that when we chatted before, I mean, that's really the definition of a data-driven public affairs agency, correct? Yep, you have to be able to prioritize starting every strategy with insights and analytics. It really has to be at the center of what you do. And it's, it's almost ironic that to talk about agency of the future, I almost view the technology as the easier part because there's so many great uh, different companies on, uh, that are available to you than, and different tools on the market. Sure, it's challenging to really narrow down and figure out, okay, where am I going to invest my resources? But the technology is relatively there. To make data actionable, that's really the hard part. The hard part is building a culture that embraces technology, that gets people at all different levels and all different corners of the company excited about how to embrace insights to enhance their work. And having the operational infrastructure to bring it together. As I mentioned, having our Kibbit Insights and Analytics team, we sit at the center of the quantitative and the qualitative. That's a critical uh, component of how we operationalize data and our clients benefit as a result and as a center, uh, to be at this, have data and analytics at the center of everything we do, that's really how we've had to structure it. The technology, the operations, and the culture uh, that makes it all run. So when you, you have data and analytics as the, the, the central foundation, um, what do you look for with regards to tools and partners um, to bring in to extend those capabilities? Like, what are the things that are important to you, important to the culture at Kivit? 
Yeah. Like an investor, you have to have a thesis that guides where you're going to direct your resources. It takes you know, money, obviously, but time and energy to really keep abreast of everything that's going on in the market. It feels like every day there's some new company cold calling me, emailing me saying, oh, this is a flashy you know, mousetrap that you can buy. And it's not about just going after all of those. You really have to have a systematic view of what you're trying to accomplish with data and analytics. Uh, for us at Kivit, we really take what I would call an audience first approach. We're constantly trying to understand different audiences that are engaging. Uh, and then, you know, beyond just what a technology can do for us, uh, you know, I've talked about sort of the intangibles, the qualitative side of, of this, and it applies to technology companies. And I would say, you know, you being on the other end of our Kivit partnership and me being on this webinar, it's pretty indicative of what we look for when we, you know, bring on a new, a new tool or technology. It's about finding partners at the end of the day, right? The technology is only one part of that equation, but being able to work with people like you and Paul and Jonathan Barnes and, and, other, and Ben and others on the, on the NewsWeb team, you know, this is this constant conversation we're always having where we're sharing feedback and ideas. You know, I was thinking when we were first talking about brainstorming what is now the crisis management feature on Spike, right? It, it's, it's an idea, it's something that's pushing the industry forward and then boom, you, you went out and created it. Like that's the relationship that we look for. And it's, yes, there's technology as part of it, but there's a much you know, more uh, qualitative part of it that it defines what we look for at a partner. Fortunately, we have NewsWhip, which uh, really emulates the standard. No, I, I appreciate you, you saying that and I'm sure the team is very happy right now back in, back in Dublin. Um, but I, I think what, I, what I'd like to, to dig in a little bit more um, on Kibbit is, I mean, you guys have established yourself as a very successful public affairs firm. Um, and given today's conversation around infrastructure, a lot of your core segments that you're supporting, you know, energy, transportation, natural resources, utilities, I mean, there's a lot of politics around this infrastructure bill. And at the end of the day, there's going to be shovels in the ground. And these projects are going to impact, you know, the American people. Um, they're going to feel it. They're going to see it. They're going to hear, hear it every day. Um, and, you know, there's, there's an interesting approach there. So how do you, as a firm, use data and analytics to support the development of these, these projects? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, infrastructure is like the most local thing and the most global thing that you can imagine all at the same time. Right. It's local because it literally becomes part of the world around you. It changes how people move and, and what people see and feel. And it lasts decades. So it's, it's essentially permanent. But it's also a window into global issues. You know, we were looking uh, just a few weeks ago about the trajectory of the Keystone Pipeline over the lifespan of when that project was proposed before it was just canceled. And you had farmers in Nebraska opposing the pipeline because it affected their grazing lands. It, it, it bisected different farms and, and, and lands. But more broadly, Keystone also represented an international issue and it encapsulated this global discussion about who's really benefiting from the movement of oil you know through a country to a port where it gets exported and that's sort of in a nutshell the, the challenge of infrastructure but to use data and analytics the complexity of infrastructure becomes an opportunity um, working with my colleagues on the insights team at Kivit and, and around our firm you know people like uh, my colleague Jonathan Sharp who's you know one of the smartest people I know and real infrastructure policy expert you know we've really developed and spearheaded what we'll call a geopolitical risk identification framework and it means thinking broadly about all the different facets of infrastructure and all the different intersects and audiences that infrastructure will ultimately impact. And you have to think about the different components of that. So whether it's the political, the regulatory, the legal, the community, the, the, the media aspect, you have to be thinking about where there's tools and technology and analytics that line up with each of those different segments so that we can really have a comprehensive view of the situation about, uh, around a particular project. What I would just point out is I just named you know, five different arenas that you have to yeah. be operating in in order to successfully orient a project for success. Now that's just broad framework. If you think about a project that may bisect just a series of towns or go between two counties or two states, or in the, in the case of Keystone, two countries, you're talking about different planning boards, different county departments, state regulators, federal agencies. There are so many different audiences you have to be making your case to before you even get outside and think that, wow, I have to talk to different public constituencies as well. So being able to use insights and analytics, uh, it really gives you the ability to think broadly 
but also narrow down into the specific segments that you're engaging with. And that's really that meticulousness is the key that makes it all run. You have to really connect the data to the real life on the ground uh, aspects of what a project needs for people. Yeah, you, you mentioned media um, and, and media coverage. And I think with something like the infrastructure bill, there's a lot of partisan coverage that's out there, a tremendous amount. And there's gonna be even more interest in coverage when these projects finally get built. Um, then you layer in misinformation and the impact misinformation is having today is gonna to continue to have you know, on all the different initiatives that layer up into the bill. How do you, how do you monitor that? How do you manage that? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I think, you know, you, you have to come with the expectation that there's geopolitical risk really embedded into everything. I mean, we saw this around the colonial pipeline cyber breach. If you look at the top influencers talking about that, it, it wasn't reporters or cybersecurity experts or even energy experts. You were looking at Mike Pompeo and Kevin McCarthy really trying to frame the entire situation as Biden failing on the on American energy independence. And that's what got the most traction. And it was it was it was the right wing outlets uh, that you would expect that were amplifying that type of message. But, you know, using Newswhip, we saw in our data that that was really what the conversation was about. It wasn't about the intricacies necessarily of, you know, how do we keep infrastructure secure in this cyber age? It was the politicization of the issue. And that's the same thing that we're seeing around the bill itself, um, you know, how we're going to fund it, what it's going to mean, what the definition of infrastructure is, right? There's political aspects to all of this discussion. But if we go back to this idea that all the projects are all local at the same time, what we need to understand, and, and I think, you know, people who are in this space know, is that a project isn't just like a one-page fact sheet. A project yeah. is hundreds, if not thousands of pages of permitting, environmental studies, you know, before you can even get the go-ahead to put a shovel in the ground. Yeah. Meanwhile, when you have a developer doing the extensive work and research of a thousand pages of a permit application, an opponent, an activist, or someone who just doesn't totally understand it because they didn't read 500 pages of text, they only need 280 characters of a tweet to generate a 500 word newspaper article. And you suddenly are on this slippery slope where you're playing defense and trying to contain a situation. Now, you could never expect everyone's going to read that permit application and just understand intuitively be like, yes, I agree. I understand why this project's happening. But the truth is what gets lost is that this is infrastructure. This is not going out to a camping site where you're gonna pitch a tent, pack it up when you're done. We're talking about highly engineered permanent structures. So you can't just plop down a hydroelectric plant or a data center just everywhere, right? There's very specific conditions of why these projects are located where they are. So in order to make sure that there's awareness and acceptance, of what the rationale behind your project, you really have to do two things. You have to be one, proactive in distilling down your story. Why is this project needed? Who is it gonna benefit? Why is it safe? And you need to, two, define that story and get people educated about it. Because if you put a 500 page permit application down cold and just expect people to figure it out on their own, that's where the misinformation will begin to emanate from. You need to really establish the set of facts rooted in research, engineering, and science, which infrastructure is, you need to use that to your advantage and, again, distill, define, and educate to be able to make sure that you're operating and developing a project in a favorable environment. Because it's not going to happen on its own, so you have to really take that into your hands and go and do it. And I, I would just end, you know, the, just my answer there by saying that we talk a lot in the analytics space about listening, right? We usually were talk talking about social listening. Well, listening as a concept is imperative at every stage of a project's lifespan. And also listening is imperative in all the different arenas and facets of a project that I mentioned. You have to be listening to what the community is saying, what stakeholders are saying, what the media is saying, because you're gonna to need to understand and identify those geopolitical risks as fast as possible so that you can make sure that you're getting your message out and addressing those concerns. So with the listening aspect and you know, managing public perception, stakeholder perception, I mean, there's a lot of platforms and outlets for people to consume news, to be able to share commentary. What are, what are some of the platforms and I guess you could say uh, tools that you use to really understand what is resonating with the public? Because um, I think that's gonna be you know, super, super important. Yeah, and, and like anything, and I think we've learned this today, you know, there's not just one tool, there's not just one arena you play in, there's not just one platform you can engage on. 
Yeah. You have to have a comprehensive strategy and approach. Take, for example, Twitter. Twitter is essential because that's where elected officials are. That's where their staffs are. That's where political candidates are. And that's where media are. So that's, there's a strategy for Twitter to really take the echo chamber of stakeholders and be able to monitor and manage there. Right. We work with you at Newswhip to be able to understand how uh, different news articles spread through Twitter. Uh, we, we use a social listening tool to be able to identify that as well and to understand the audiences that are engaging on Twitter. Yeah. But that's just one lane. Facebook is where advocacy takes place. That's where everyday people, you know, the, the sort of the more rank and file residents of a community are going to be most likely to find out about a project and sign up to take an action about it. Right. If Twitter is, you know, a quarter of Americans. Facebook's going to be 80% of Americans. So you need a strategy for Facebook that's much more uh, oriented towards communicating with the public. Yeah. And now we just talk about social media. Factor in news coverage, news articles. And now we're in the, the zone of talking about how we use news web. And th what's interesting is based on our data, I, I view news in this context of infrastructure as really like the gas that gets poured on a fire. A news is the headline that get feeds into social media platforms and gets shared rapidly. And it's off of that that you see the comments, the shares, the reactions, the tags, the actions. So news, you have to be on the cusp of what news is doing because it's going to fuel those other channels. And it's going to all bleed into each other. We have data from looking at both NewsWhip, where you can see what gets shared, as well as different first-party data insights of what gets read. And when you compare the two, what we've often found is that there's an inverse relationship. The more a headline gets shared, the less it gets read. So we have to start with an assumption that if those different stakeholders are on Twitter, if the public is on Facebook, they're all just reading headlines for the most part, right? So from an earned media perspective, a strategic communications perspective, um, like what our teams at Kivit might do, if we're getting a quote from a, a third party validator or for a client in a news story, if it's not the headline or say the first paragraph, we need to operate with the assumption that people may not be reading it because it's getting shared and shared and shared. And it's really the headline that's getting taken away. Mm -hmm. So we, that's again, goes back to the concept I talked about earlier. It's about how do we tell our own story, define the, the, the rationale for the project, create a supportive environment and not let anyone else do that for you, even if it's news coverage, right? Because people are only gonna see that headline and that becomes the basis of people's interpretations and view of what a project is or is not. So, so there's the importance of the real-time data, right? Being able to capture that, um, see how things are migrating through the, the, the various channels. Um, that's important to understand the external dynamics for infrastructure, but then these projects could take 20 years, right? So it's really a question of how do you marry the real-time element with any of the longer-term data to inform your, your strategies? That's a great point. I mean, if you're only playing the short term strategy, you're missing the full picture. As you can see today, our theme is like puzzle pieces, puzzle pieces on arenas, puzzle pieces on jurisdictions, puzzle pieces in the short term versus the long term. And I think the really critical point about where we are now in culture and in politics around infrastructure, is that it really is about that long term view. We are seeing today amidst, you know, the, the, the revisiting of everything that our system has created and the, the inequity that it creates. Infrastructure is a big part of that. When I was 15 years old, I read The Power Broker for the first time. I've read it three times since. This is the Robert A. Caro book about Robert Moses who built New York. And you could see, and you're seeing this cited more and more in the news today, about the inequity and the system, system, systemic racism built into infrastructure projects. How do we learn from those mistakes? And how do we create projects going forward that really address this issue of environmental justice for people, that we're creating fairness through infrastructure? I think what we're seeing now as part of President Biden's approach to infrastructure is a broader definition of what infrastructure truly means that takes into account those long-term ramifications of what it really creates. Um, there was a great quote from President Biden in talking about his plan and his broad definition of infrastructure, where he said, 200 years ago, trains weren't traditional infrastructure either, until America made a choice to lay down tracks across the country. So when you think about the first steps of new infrastructure, things that don't exist necessarily in mainstream society today, you know, as we're getting electric charging stations, for example, um, you know, as people talk about Bitcoin mining, right? That's something that's further down the road. We need to be taking a long view about what all of this means, because when we talk about infrastructure, as we were saying earlier, and as you just mentioned, it may take 20 years to build and get permitted, but it's going to be around for 100 years. We're talking about generational impact as a result. So if you're coming into a project, not taking into account the consequences of what you're doing and how it's going to impact environmental justice, 
it's it's also just as risky not to be coming into a project and thinking retroactively because of the issues, uh, the systemic issues that have come out of infrastructure from our past. You need to know what the consequences of that were. There's oftentimes we come into a project and we're trying to understand what happened in that community, that county, 70 years ago. It might be a real estate project that's trying to be built today where they want to demolish something that means something to a whole lot of people because it, it may not be a landmark, but it might be historic and meaningful to people. It might be that you come into a community and there might have been some type of accident or spill or something 50 years ago, but it's still on the minds of the people who matter, who elect the elected officials that are going to have a say over whether this project moves forward. So coming into a, a, an infrastructure scenario, you need to be thinking about the long-term ramifications of what you're doing, but also understand the consequences of what's been done before. It, this is a fascinating space and why I'm obsessed with it is, as a passion is because you have to piece these puzzle pieces together to get that full view. It's critical. Yeah, and I think um, the average person, when you think about infrastructure, there's a lot of sectors that we don't consider or you know, aren't really informed about. Um, I think that will be an interesting question is maybe could you talk about you know, really some of the, the segments that have a big public affairs impact, but maybe don't get the mainstream coverage in the headlines. Um, I'd be curious to see what your take is on what some of those segments are. Yeah, and I, I would say they don't make the headlines maybe on a regular basis, but they're, you know, I think you have, whatever infrastructure segment you are in, you have to have the expectation that you have the ability to go viral right? You yeah. can just tap it. And the less people know about your segment, it used to be a strength, right? You can sort of keep your head down, do the work, get the project done. No more. Because if there's not awareness, acceptance, uh, support for what you're doing, that again, as I mentioned earlier, that's your greatest risk going into a situation. Uh, I think about, to take a specific example, I think a lot about data centers. You know, there's parts of Virginia where data centers, a third of the, comprise a third of the world, uh, the country's uh, internet traffic going through one county in Virginia. But a data center can be a very controversial issue, even though for the most part, this is a building that doesn't emit anything visible. It might be noisy. It might be dressed up to look like an office building. It might be dressed up to look like a barn I've seen. You know, I, I've actually read a whole uh, magazine about the architecture of data centers and the external way that you sort of get it to blend in with the community. But a data center has a lot of different pressure points for people. It gets people riled up about the threat of security, right? This is critical, high value infrastructure in your town. There's health concerns. People don't understand what are all these servers emitting that I can't see, right? It may not be smokestack, but is there radiation I need to be concerned with? What's the health impact? And then there's environmental concerns, right? This is an energy intensive technology. What can, you know, this mean for the future of a sustainable, clean energy future? These are the issues that come up around data centers, which, you know, in a comparison to other types of industries, particularly around manufacturing, where there's much more of a visible impact, you know, this is something that would seem on the, on the face of it benign until you start digging into it and what might go into a permit application, for example. This is where you have an industry that may not be, you know, forefront every day, but has a huge public affairs um, consequence that needs to be evaluated through our geopolitical risk framework. Yeah, I mean, and I would just add, segment that that's related to data centers that kind of gets talked about especially now as you see a lot of states moving towards cannabis legalization yeah. is how do you create a supply chain within your state for to support cannabis and cannabis grow houses the cultivation stages this is a very similar profile as data centers you may not see anything being emitted but it takes a lot of energy there's people that are concerned about the security the health the environmental consequences of that and it's something that is essential infrastructure in the sense that you have these states setting up new legalized cannabis markets it's prohibited at the federal level so you can't move it across state lines so whether you're in north dakota or new jersey you're going to need to have a cannabis supply chain and that's infrastructure and it's going to have a very similar profile as i mentioned to data centers where it may be below the surface but it can rile up the same concerns of people and that ultimately needs to be addressed to successfully you know develop and operate yeah no i, I didn't think of the comparisons from the cannabis distribution outlets to the data centers it's super interesting and i think before we Go to the audience for some questions. Um, clearly, you're very passionate about infrastructure, and I feel that I see that coming off this interview, which I'm I'm really enjoying. Um, tell me a bit about that. I mean, how you know your 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 passion on infrastructure? We talked about you know, going to the national parks and and looking at infrastructure on your ways there. Um, you know, what started it, and, and can you give us some examples? 
Yeah, I wish I could tell you what, what, what really started it, but I could tell you it's in my blood. I, uh, I am an infrastructure geek, true and true, and I am uh, proud of that. Um, you know, most people go on vacation, they look to how do they get to the beach. I'm trying to seek out infrastructure. I have dragged family and friends alike to see things like a landfill in Southern Ohio, a coal mine in North Dakota, an underground salt mine in Kansas, a feedlot in Nebraska, an oil refinery in New Jersey. Uh, and perhaps a few years ago, I, I really met my match with infrastructure that I got to work on as part of my uh, work at Kivet, and it was for the Erie Canal Bicentennial. Talk about infrastructure with a story. It faced opposition back in the early 1800s. I don't think our social listening monitors actually go back that far, but I'm, I'm sure <laughs> look at any infrastructure at any point in time, it will follow a similar framework in some ways to what I've already described. So I, I view infrastructure, as I said, and where I think my passion comes from, as a real way of understanding the world around us and the ability to shape what our world becomes. Very cool, very cool. Um, okay, we have, there's a bunch of questions that came in here. Um, okay, well, here's pretty simple. You know, where do you see the future of infrastructure heading over the next five years? Well, look, I think we saw it with Colonial Pipeline. I think we're seeing it, um, you know, with the cyber attacks going around, even a company like JBS Meats. Meat, food production, part of our infrastructure. I think you're going to see any type of infrastructure is going to have a digital cyber component. The ability to secure those assets and develop infrastructure that is not only secure from kind of the community perspective, but from the yeah. cyber perspective. And, and that's going to be the kind of thing that throws uh, like a food production segment into the headlines, right? It yeah. may not be because something broke at the plant. It's because the cyber component of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we have time for one more. Let's check back here. Okay. Oh, interesting. Infrastructure seems to bubble up to the servicing conversations around election platforms. Um, do you plan differently for midterm elections versus presidential bids? Ooh, it's, a, it's an interesting one. You plan the same for them all. You know, a candidate could be running an election four years from now, but you're going to get an inkling of what they're going to make noise about today. Yes. The politicization of infrastructure is something we talked about earlier, and it's something that you have to anticipate, right? If you're trying to build a project mid-cycle or in the early stages of what's going to be an election cycle, either two or four years out, you have to be you have to be factoring in who are the loud voices that are going to help shape perceptions about projects. And again, it goes back to this idea that if you are not telling that story yourself. You are going to cede the ground to someone with a very strong political agenda. In this case, we're talking about candidates. And that's going to create significant risk for your project that could potentially put you on defense because that candidate is getting up every morning to push their agenda, push their message. And I'll tell you, you know, something like infrastructure can really get, because it's so local and it, and it really gets encapsulated in how people experience their lives, it's a really ripe target. You know, that, that's the issue. And, be, and again, we've talked about how infrastructure is so highly engineered, so specially chosen to do this project here for this reason. And it's, a, it's, it's totally in conflict. And it really is, you know, gets back to why insights and analytics are important. Because if you're not aware of the environment around you and you're not shaping it proactively, that's going to come and bite you in the end. Yep. Zach, I love having you on these webinars. You're awesome, uh, super intelligent, and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to, to share with us and our audience and learning more about your, your, your continued success at Kivit. So thank you. Thank you, Brad. And thank you to uh, Paul and the whole Newswhip team. Um, you guys are terrific partners. Awesome. Um, great. So uh, this wraps up our edition. This is our 20th edition of the Newswhip Pulse. So thanks again, Zach, and thanks for everyone for for listening in, um, please do join us on our next webinar. We have one on Wednesday, June 30th, and we'll be joined by another insights guru, uh, Brian Mossop, who heads intelligence at Fleischmann Hillard's Methods of Mastery. Um, Brian has a great experience in the communication space, a former editor from, from Wired, PhD in biomedical engineering. He's gonna be chatting with Paul Quigley, um, who's the CEO of Newswhip about prediction. So we're very excited to, to listen to that. And thanks again for everyone for contributing, Zach, you for all of your insights here. And uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.